here. So uh, we are still here. My betting pool, I'm, I'm currently winning. I'm the only one saying that the university is going to go the entire semester. So I've thus far eliminated all other competitors in my normal place of business, as they all thought we wouldn't even make it to week two. So here we are at week five. <laughs> Suckers. All right. We're going to go a uh, step away from SQL uh, out of this lesson into the web in general. So topics for today, we're going to see how a website interfaces front end to connect the back end and get data from a database, like complete the whole logical loop. A lot of you asked to, that this was something you wanted to see in our initial survey. And so this is where we're going to make that jump. Um, we're going to review uh, some additional SQL capabilities, discuss normal forms uh, and what that means as far as data normalization. Although from what I saw in reviewing everyone's uh, videos, the databases you have are quite normalized, which is very nice. But um, critique and review your databases. And we're gonna see a Django app end to end built by one of your classmates. And um, we're gonna establish the next lab uh, from there. So. Uh, I'm going to start trying to add these to future slides, but um, just some potential resume bullet points. If you're looking for things to beef it up when you go submit for interviews or whatever, right? I try to mix in skills and technologies that you can actually act upon and use and are used other places. So like ER diagramming, Slack, YouTube, uh, cPanel, which is what you had to engage with last week. cPanel is an older server technology, admittedly, but it's still, you know, it's still something that shows up on lots of different places. Um, and then SQL, MySQL, PHP, MyAdmin, all that good stuff. So, uh, so we'll start out with critique this week. As I mentioned, it's really grueling. Um, as I have almost no feedback. Um, last, I'd say two weeks ago, I had a ton of feedback, a lot of nitpicky stuff. Um, it seemed like basically everyone went and applied that to their models, which is awesome, and then applied from the models into their actual database design. So um, just some general feedback this week, because I really didn't see anything glaring uh, in anyone's uh, database setup, um, is uh, table and field names just seek consistency. A couple people still using like spaces and things, which isn't terrible, but it would be a pain in the ass to actually use. Um, multiple people explain booleans and data types appropriately, so that's awesome. Um, understanding that when you put something in as a boolean, that's going to be converted to like a tiny int that's a uh, one character as far as a zero or a one. Um, so great work overall demonstrating technique in each of the major CRUD operators as well as the joins. Almost everybody was able to successfully do the joins and explain what was going on. Um, and then uh, we're going to keep slowly working these concepts into other contexts. And by other concepts, I mean ER diagramming, entity relationships, SQL. Um, we're going to mix this into other more relevant technologies, in my opinion. So going forward, we're going to sprinkle in some ER and SQL throughout in future data modeling work. Um, I want to focus on some things that you all identified as being of far more interest in your surveys um, and then how those relate to entity relationships and SQL. Um, so we're gonna start transitioning into the web. So don't throw away your databases, delete them or your diagrams, like keep those, we'll refer back to them at times. Future labs will draw upon the content of those. But we're into act two of Sonic. I think this is Sonic CD. I don't even know which one this is from. I tried to, I just searched for the word act two and Sonic came up. So um, this is kind of the second part of the course. Uh, we're moving into content management systems and how databases actually live out on the web, things you can touch and play with. And we can hopefully start to build out and see some examples of things running hundreds of SQL queries per page, as opposed to sitting in the weeds, painstakingly writing SQL to make a fictional database app, okay? So we're gonna try to make this a little more realistic now that you understand the layers beneath these things. So. <laughs> we'll talk about SQL for a minute though. So uh, we didn't touch on normal forms and it's in part because every professional that I've ever interfaced with in the field that I ask if they've normalized the database, they say WTF mate, because they have, they don't think that way, right? And basically normal forms boils down to thinking in terms of private keys, in terms of redundancy of data, canonical sources, 
and that's usually an exercise better spent through actually doing it and trying to make usable data as opposed to saying, are we uh, engaging in second normal form or third normal form data here, team? Like no one talks that way, but yet this was an anchor of what this course was previously. So the basic thing you need to know with normal forms, there's effectively six normal forms that are expressed. I'd say I, in my career, have only seen a few things move beyond third normal form. But so um, the basic premise is that as you make data more and more normalized, it becomes more usable, repeatable, and referenceable. So I don't know if you know this, but the internet is an amazing resource. And as I said, I've never once used language associated with normal forms in my 13 year career at this moment. Um, so if you want to learn more about data normalization, these are three links that I think explain it very well, um, particularly this third one. Um, and I will say that deferring to experts is a sign of wisdom and not a lack thereof. If you know someone else knows something better than you, then why struggle through it and then have someone have the first comment on YouTube say, oh my gosh, my professor wasted three hours of my life. So um, I found this, this article uh, by Lorraine Lee, uh, who's a data scientist, and she really boils down the first three normal forms very concisely, I thought. Um, most of the explanations are technically accurate, but just kind of in the weeds and you get lost quickly. But so first normal form is um, the data is stored in tables with rows uniquely identified by a primary key. We effectively satisfied first, first normal form throughout all of our diagram process when I kept emphasizing we need unique keys, we need a way that this data is uniquely identifiable. So if, if you have data in a table that's not relatable elsewhere, you're not even at first normal form. So most likely, at least with everything that I saw, everyone's tables are hitting a first normal form of data, which is great. Um, the other critical thing is there's no repeating groups of information, right? So if you have 16803 in a database and it's a location, you don't want there to be two things that would potentially relate to 16803 in the event that for like our hospital example, how many hospitals are in 16803, right? I don't want that uh, question to come up with multiple answers based on which table you join in. Um, second normal form, and this is how they stack on each other, is effectively building on everything from the first and then only data that relates to a table's primary key is stored in each table. Right, so most of you are able to achieve this. Um, this would be kind of those areas where I said there's a many to many relationship. We split that out into another table uh, to make sure that when we bridge these gaps that we have um, material that makes sense still, but that each table is only responsible for things that really should be in its table. Um, and then the third normal form is that there's no in table dependencies between the columns in the table. So let's word it a little awkwardly. Um, but that would be having information that you'd want to join within the same table um, would imply that you probably should have something in another table. Like if you had uh, hospital, if you had patient and the hospital they were in and the hospital was in the same exact row of information as the patient, but yet hospital shows up in another table and you didn't do a key relationship. You just had like Mount Nittany Hospital as a string is where this patient is located. And then somewhere else in a hospital table is Mount Nittany. Right, so making sure that there is, there isn't those inter-table dependencies like that outside of keys. Um, it's a really good piece she wrote up. It says it's a medium article. It says it's about 11 minute read. I'd highly recommend just skimming through it. She also has this quote in it that I thought worded it much better than I have previously in thinking through this. Uh, note there are actually six levels of normalization. However, the third normal form is considered the highest level necessary for most applications. So we will only be discussing the first three. Um, you get very abstract by the time you hit like six. I wanna say level six would be like that there's no more than one field per primary key. <laughs> You're getting into very abstract data that would be very cumbersome to update uh, after the fact. So that is the end of SQL or otherwise known as simple quick lesson and this backslash is for HTML for those of you who don't know what HTML is. So I'm going to try to mix SQL through everything else uh, every week, a little snippet or we'll look at some SQL calls and then reverse engineer them. Um, but uh, and at risk of putting everyone to sleep and making this the most boring course as most SRT information has been over the last several years, I'd like to actually make this about things that you all said you care about. So. 
uh, we're going to talk about the web and where databases are actually made useful, which is not an objective of this course, but yet you would think it would be. So uh, boiling down a web app is in some minor terminology. Most web applications, you're going to boil down to a front end and a back end, simplest form. So on the front end, you are basically always outside of phone apps now talking about HTML, JavaScript, CSS, or like some type of phone GUI. Um, increasingly, even a lot of Android apps are actually written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, iOS being in C Sharp, but a lot of that stuff is still going to have its own UI libraries, things that have parallels to HTML. So think of the front end as what the user experiences, engages with. If you're in a browser, it's the thing you could right click and view source. That is the front end code delivered to you, you're engaging with. Back end uh, can be many things, but again, highly simplified for what we're describing here is uh, there's some scripting language of some kind, and that could be something like PHP, Python, Go, Ruby, Node. There's a lot of different back end languages. Those are just a couple. Um, and then there's a, the back end is going to be responsible for all the advanced logic and interfacing with the front end, right? So think of the back end server as when you connect to a website or an app, it's saying, oh, here's the page I should send you. But then it's also doing the processing when you fill out a form or you submit, you know, a blog post or something to capture that information and then interface with the database and store it. So um, boiling down, is anyone in IST 220? I won't see your hand up online because I don't have that thing up. So at some point you'll have to take IST 220. And IST 220 is about networking. So let me consolidate the entire course into the only two slides of information I remember from it. So in 219 less slides, this is effectively what we're talking about with the web. That there's the front end of the application, some APIs, it's usually JavaScript, CSS, and HTML. It's to deliver to you via something called HTTP, which is a, is a transport protocol that actually bridges the connection between the browser and the server. That layer is where you'll learn a lot more about in IST 220, but that is then actually stacked on, type of, on top of the IP address of the server, making a secure handshake with the server, uh, DNS lookup, which is a bunch of domain servers that help bridge the fact that you typed in google.com to what their, whatever the associated IP address is, okay? So this is effectively the web and it getting to you. Um, Mozilla and this one article about HTTP can pretty much replace IST 220 in my opinion, but um, another nice visual they have is this, right? All the assets of that page are getting pushed to you through the internet, and those might actually go to different backend servers, right? So there might be a server that's serving up the content of your website. There might be something specific for videos, something specific for ads, and those have specific file names in the way that they get there, just so we're on the same page. So visualizing what our current interaction is, what you all just interfaced with in the last lab via PHP my admin, right? We've got this amazing user over here and the amazing user is gonna use a front end technology, right? Which is either your website or your phone app. So you're connecting via the front end. That's then gonna to talk to the back end. In this case, reclaim hosting, hosting a PHP driven application. And it's gonna to connect to your MySQL database. So this is effectively the transaction going on with PHP my admin. PHP my admin is a lot of PHP server side code that just runs SQL queries and presents to you what's going on. So in this example, we're going to uh, just stick with PHP and MySQL. Um, I'm going to hit them a bunch in this in this class. They are by no means um, bleeding edge industry standards anymore. This is kind of uh, into legacy mode. Most people do not build new applications on MySQL. Most people build monolithic websites on PHP and MySQL. And I'm not using monolith in a derogatory form. Um, it's just if you have a team of people that need to contribute to something, the requirements of performance might be co-opted by the fact that, hey, there's this really nice PHP app, it's open source. Hey, it connects easily to this MySQL database. Let's just use this to get the job done. Uh, a lot of startups are not gonna be built on these foundational pieces of technology, for example. Anyway, uh, so we're gonna keep it simple in this case. So there are lots of other ways to set up servers. We'll touch on some other server technology briefly, like mentioning Docker. We might have something on Docker at some level later. Um, but we're gonna just stick to the LAMP stack because it's one of the oldest ones, it's easiest to understand. There's an alternative to the LAMP stack. And if you ever see the phrase LAMP, it stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. 
right? So when that website gets to you, it's delivered via, or brokered via Apache. When you connect to the domain, Apache is sending you the files. MySQL is your database, obviously. And then PHP is the scripting language, kind of stitching those two together. Uh, Linux is thrown in there because you need an operating system. Uh, an alternative one, if you see it ever, is LEMP. And I can't pronounce LEMP correctly. I don't know why the hell it's LEMP. There's no E in here, but uh, LEMP is Linux, Nginx, uh, MySQL, and PHP. I don't know why. That's, that's just the common industry vernacular. But um, if you want to think of it another way, you can swap out any of these layers and you're going to get a web application. So you've got your operating system of some form. Now, most of the world is Linux at this point, but there's different ones, uh, especially in Microsoft Azure, even though they're now starting to run a lot of Linux environments too. Um, there's something to broker the server connections, uh, whether that's Nginx, Apache, um, I believe Go, Lighty. I mean, there's other alternatives there. Uh, then databases, there's things that are NoSQL, there's MySQL, there's um, uh, MongoDB. Um, so there's going to be a database, a storage engine of some kind. And then there's going to be a scripting language, something to do the processing, advanced logic, actual heavy programming to make this all go. So returning to our, our Simpsons app, the stupid Simpsons app, or SSA, um, we're going to look at a very basic example that I rigged up. So we can illustrate in part why PHP and MySQL uh, had this partnership that gained so much adoption. Uh, and by so much adoption, I mean WordPress. If any of you have used sites.psu.edu or a WordPress site in general, WordPress is estimated to power anywhere from 30 to 50% of the internet. Um, it's written entirely in PHP and, and MySQL. It's a flaming dumpster fire of conventions and it's terrible and hacked to bits all the time. And we'll review some of the code later on as to where that happens. But ignoring that, um, looking at a very basic PHP application here, right? I've got a username, a password, the database I want to talk to. And then I have a host and host is, uh, think of this as like the IP address or what's the way of accessing the server. Part of why MySQL and PHP caught on the way that they did is there are calls native to PHP to connect to MySQL databases. <laughs> so when you make something the path of least resistance, it's going to win out a lot more easily with developers, right? So in PHP, I can say, oh, stupid thing out of the way there. Keep showing up for people. All right, so in PHP, I have, let me make this a little bigger. There we go. So on the PHP side, I have my SQLI uh, with connect. I pass it a host, username, password, and a database. And then I'm going to kind of step between what's going on behind the scenes and what's on the front end of this. So on the front end, we might have this really dumb page. And there's actually a URL. You can go to it now or you know later if you're following along with the notes or whatever. And it actually is there. Um, but it says, oh, hey, you connected successfully. So the reason it's saying it connected successfully is on the PHP side of this script, it's saying write successful connection in the event that I was able to actually connect to a database. Simplest form. Then get the host information and print it out. So the host information here is just saying, yeah, I was able to connect to Un uh, a, a Unix-based system. It's on localhost. This is not something you'd ever put in an application. It's just to show you what actually is occurring when those calls get stitched together. So next on the, the real54.com slash db.php, if you feel like going there, uh, there's a table and the table says what the cast list, the characters and the episodes are. So in order to generate that table, what I was able to stitch together is you can actually query the database, right? So this is similar to when you're in PHP my admin, you hit the SQL button and you just type whatever. Um, more or less, I can broker that same thing, but in my application. So in, in this application, it's saying query link, which is the connection to the database, and then ask it show tables and show the tables from a certain database, right? So we didn't cover show tables, but there's some other little things you know, baked into uh, SQL that you can make calls and kind of get some, you know, you can manage and manipulate user data, who has access to what. Um, but also things like metadata, like, hey, show me what tables are in our database. Um, so then, then we loop through the uh, tables that come across. 
And for each table, I'm saying, hey, show the columns that that table has. So then it's going to loop through the columns and it's going to print them out. Now, I'm not asking you to write this PHP necessarily, right, because this isn't a programming class, but just so that we can see what the relationship is between these things. So as we go through, you can see, okay, it's going to loop through the tables in our database. It found three of them. So it's going to write cast list. Then it's going to look for all the columns in there. And it's going to write the field, which is where I get ID, the type, which is where I get int 11. And then uh, this is called ternary, but it's a, it's a way of translating the value coming across says null, no, yes or no. Well, I want it to print not null or null. At the simplest form, this is what you're seeing in the PHP MyAdmin interface. So in their interface, when you're able to click through a nice UI and administer your database, this is effectively what they have there. So the next part of the app shows, actually renders BART um, from the initial example. And this is then on the front end again. So as you scroll down through that file, see this is just printing out all the characters in different episodes. So uh, we see here we have another query that we're firing up, right? So we have sh uh, show the characters in episodes. And then two things of note in this query, uh, one thing we didn't talk about when we did. So first is that you can actually rename values in SQL. So in this case, I can say, you know, select characters.photo as image. That means that when it forms the select between the two different tables, um, if you remember in the initial example I did, oh, um, let's, let's see all the episodes that the character's in. And in the output, it actually said name Bart Simpson. And then the next column next to it said name Treehouse of Horror. That's because there's a name field in each table. And I'm just saying, we'll stitch them together. So then the output gets really confusing looking, right? Because I have two things called name. So what as lets you do is basically cast that as something else. So that the output would be, hey, uh, when, I have, when I do this join, I want you to give me the photo, actually call it image, and then characters.name as name, episodes.name as episode. And this allows you to tweak the way that the, the data is output when it's stitched together across different tables. It's very useful, especially complex joins. Um, then I'm doing a left join, right? So this is gonna say, give me the episodes, mash it up with the cast list, even if there is a character that isn't in an episode, right? So even if they're not listed, I want to see all the characters that we have in our database. Then I'm just going through and printing the name, printing the episode, and then this is just for the sake of um, uh, the image. We didn't use any blobs in our example, but in my database, I had a blob. And a data blob um, is basically taking a file and chunking it into its bits. So in this case, it's called base64. So I take the image and I base64 encode it, which says every 64 pieces of information is part of this new image. And it basically stitches the image back together out of data. So all of that is enough to say character is Bart, episode is whatever episode from that table, and then I have my photo here. So the last part of this uber simple form is um, uh, inserting data. So obviously in your, you know, Facebooks or Instagrams or literally anything else on the internet, you're going to have an input form if you're submitting and contributing data to whatever it is. So at its basest form, a form is literally just HTML input. In this case, um, saying, hey, there's a form, and then you say action, which is when someone clicks submit, where should I send this information? So basically it's redirecting the URL to send information somewhere. Uh, this is the main way that you get data from the front end and the user interacting with it, even if it's that, you know, like pull the, pull the reload data or whatever on your phone, that's still hitting a form going to the back end saying, hey, they pulled the screen, what should we do in refreshing data? So in this instance, I have a hidden field that just says characters. I have uh, a main character checkbox, and then I have a name, and that would be the name of the person ad. So if I fill this out, like stitching it back to our visual, right? So if I say Smithers is a main character and hit submit, it's gonna send those values to the back end Right, there's another script that's gonna process this. In this case, it says go to insert.php. So it's gonna take the values from this input field and send them to the backend to um, input.php. 
So looking at input.php, if I go to that, I don't think, oh, I think I can do this in full screen now. There we go. So going to input.php, we see it's very simplified. Again, I have to connect to the database to establish that connection. And then in this first box, I have uh, get. Now this is some little internal um, logic associated with PHP, but when you say this dollar sign underscore get, it's basically saying someone submitted information to me and it has these, these variables as the values. So I'm able to grab those values from the front end, process them on the back end, and in this case, I say, all right, we're gonna do insert into table, which is whatever table came across. Um, looking at this form, right, table here is characters. So we're gonna get characters as the name of the, the variable table. Main is just gonna be a yes or no checkbox. And then name is gonna be Smithers is what we should expect to see. So then I translate that into a statement similar to how you were all able to do your autocompletes right, in the UI or just writing an insert statement and say insert into table name and main and the values are, and then in this case, I'm, it looks a little weird, but I'm just escaping quotes oops, uh, to make sure that they, that the values get passed in correctly. So when we do that, we're actually going to see, and you can, if you go to that link, I'll probably go to it in a little bit, but if you go to the link, you can see insert into characters, right, and this is what it generated. It adds Smithers, in this case, the episode list. In the original example, photo is not a required field. And I'm also not a having a photo upload field, but you could just add input type equals file. Uh, I just didn't feel like uploading photos. But then we can see the parallel to our MySQL database over on the left, right? So we have at the bottom uh, character ID 16, which was auto incremented because it's a primary key. And I said in the previous example, auto increment this when the data comes in. Name is Smithers, main is equal to one because it's a Boolean. So are there any questions about that super base go back and forth translation? I'll actually go to the little, the little app as well. <laughs> app app in the weirdest sense of the word. This is by no means an app. There we go. There we go. Okay. So this is the app quote unquote that I have. And then I say, clear beans, hit submit. It tells me, hey, I'm inserting into characters. And we can see the get parameters in this case are up above, right? So it says table equals characters, name equals cool beans. And I can actually change this to be stuff. Hit enter and then it'll rewrite it and say, hey, there's stuff there as our insert. And then I'm gonna go back. And now I have stuff and, oh, maybe I got mad that I didn't put a full uh, in character, cool beans. Make sure to get that cool beans insert there. And we'll change this to things. Go back. There we go, okay. So, and right there is a very minor issue as far as back-end form validation, right? So I didn't select main character. The back-end went, oh crap, there's no value here. I don't know what to do. And then the database had an integrity constraint making sure that I don't insert nothing. Because if I do name equals whatever, you see it's blank. Well, that's a Boolean value. So having that set to one or zero is whether or not this transaction even goes through. So because it's empty, it's not gonna go through. So, Oh, shit, this slide again. Okay, so we, we done screwed up. We screwed up badly, gang, okay? We wrote this application custom by hand, and then I explained it to you all, but now the whole server is compromised and we don't know why. So does any, can anyone think of why what I just showed as an example is completely flawed? Because you could enter people so for people online, so yes, that's exactly what it is. It's like you read the slides ahead of time or you know what you're talking about. So uh, the answer is you could have just written any arbitrary SQL you wanted in those input boxes and hit submit. So uh, you already skipped ahead to the other 
side of this. I was going to ask, any SRA majors know what SQL injection is? Does anyone know what SQL injection is? Yeah, you know, of course you know what SQL injection is. You just said it was. So <laughs> SQL injection is a code injection technique used to attack data-driven applications where malicious SQL is inserted into an entry field and then it assumes that that's going to be executed. In this little example Wikipedia gives, it says it's dumping the database contents back to the attacker. It could be literally anything. So the general rule of thumb is never trust users. Um, W3 schools, which again, I've criticized before, but they have a nice little, you know, hello world level introduction to this. They give this nice little example here, which is very similar to what we had above to say, okay, so the example here is select all or select everything from users, drop table suppliers. And then if the user was able, whoops, if the user is able to input, right, let's see from this example string put together, hey, select everything from users where user ID equals the input of the user. We can't trust the user. So if the user is nice, they'll put in 105. If they're evil, like all robots that go and attack billions of times a day, even just at Penn State, uh, that our firewall catches, um, they would say, send something like 105 colon, and then whatever the hell they feel like executing. Um, so you can see that then just by entering that in the field, I'd be able to do the drop table suppliers as well, which is a malicious action. So in our super hackable example, that's where this came into play, right? We're getting values and input from the user. In this case, it came through the query parameters, which is even more dangerous. And then we're able to basically rewrite part of the query and potentially hijack what's happening. Even if it's doing two inserts, even if it's completing this one insert and because we changed the table name, which is another thing that we shouldn't be sending through the URL, but we could be doing one insert and then completing a second one at the end, but in the middle stuff our malicious execution. So while this seems like a very trivial, silly scenario and you'd say, well, I'll never run into this or I'll never write code that does that, that's great. Um, but it still happens at scale, even in modern day. So 2014 is six years ago now. Unfortunately, we're on about Drupal Geddon three at this point. Uh, Drupal Geddon was a, a hack that was impacting millions of sites. I'd say it's part of the reason Drupal started to lose popularity because its entire image was corrupted around this hack. So uh, I, can, I can confirm since I was involved in some of the repair work that multiple properties in IST and the university were exploited as a result of this. Um, and it's a, it's a unique problem to open source, right? If everybody is doing their work out in the open, that means the bad guys can come and review the work too and find a, a flaw and then just exploit it to all, uh, all end. So what happened in Drupal Geddon, uh, which is a pretty famous massive hack is, uh, I will always recommend to use abstraction. We're actually gonna see an example from Jonah of abstraction at play and how that helps. We'll, we'll look at it in Drupal to see what their abstraction is to help with this security layer issue. But abstraction's only as good as if it actually is secure. <laughs> So if a million sites um, on the internet are using the same abstraction technique and there's a fundamental flaw in that abstraction, you now have a million exploitable sites on the internet. And that's what happened with Drupal Geddon. So um, it actually got introduced three years prior to anyone noticing. So this was a bug introduced in 2011. Hackers didn't start exploiting it until 2014. Um, uh, at Penn State, we were seeing thousands of hits per hour at our firewall for this specific exploit. Um, the issue with open source projects and um, Russian troll bots or whatever, whatever foreign actor um, is, uh, if it's open source, you can script something and write a test to ensure that it actually is going to infect something. Then you load that into a botnet and you just spam properties. So. Um, there's a really good write-up on this um, by, I don't actually know what this company is, the Seven Elements uh, website. But they have a really good write-up as to how this was uh, able to be exploited. Um, it had to do with user logins or just any exposed form. That's how deeply embedded this hack was, unfortunately. So um, for sad, hilarious sake, um, there's this flow chart that you can find. It's on the project page of Drupal.org project Drupal Geddon. And all the red boxes imply like you're screwed. So um, this top part that I'm showing is only like 
a third of the chart because the rest is, oh crap, here's how you try to do mitigation and figure out what happened. Um, there were a lot of bots loaded up that would basically start to perform a select, you know, user by name type of query and then add on to that and give me the admin account. And so you could easily send a request that would just log you in as the admin on any property. Um, Drupal for context powers everything from the PSU.edu website. It used to power the White House in the previous administration. It powers uh, the Grammys, um, MSNBC. Like it hits some very large properties <laughs> that need to really take security seriously. So this is a big deal. Um, so there are ways to avoid injection, just simple ways. All languages and, li and frameworks end up having abstractions that help sanitize query input. The general rule of thumb is we never trust the user in any scenario. Um, and another general rule is to stick to abstractions. If there's a way of interfacing with the database, it shouldn't be done via writing a query manually. There's usually libraries that will write the query for you that bake in the sanitization. Um, so a lot of web frameworks help provide these abstractions to help prevent uh, SQL uh, um, attacks. So now uh, we're gonna switch to uh, poning the prof. So this is a student-led presentation by Jonah. Jonah, are you in the are you in the, the Zoom call? Okay. So uh, Jonah's in class. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and I'm gonna turn it over to Jonah. Jonah rig, I actually, I think it was in like the first class. I mentioned, hey, if you you know have any interest in helping build out any web stuff, just let me know. Um, Jonah stepped up and made this. A uh, really cool example of our database connection app, but done in um, in Django, right? Okay, so I'm going to make you a co-host. Um, so you should be able to share a screen. Can you share a screen? There we go. All right. Well, now you've done it. Are you unmuted? It would help if I would unmute it myself. <laughs> so this is just a simple website I created. It takes in four inputs, a username, just type something real quick, their age, uh, 40, and then a creation date. And if they have COVID or not, you just hit submit. And it's just that simple, it just goes to the database. What's actually happening in the back end is I used a, a web framework in Python called Django. So this is the database creation. This is what the framework is referencing. You have your user here with a char field, which is we've seen that before, and then a date time field. And it just keeps going down specifying what type of value the database is looking for. And so this is a really good example of abstraction, right? So part of this is the translation um, to the physical form, right? You see patient, in, in, instead of saying class there, patient, right? Because it looks code-esque. Think of that just as your, one of your tables you were diagramming, right? So that's patient as the top of the name of the table, and then user being a, a potential field. Then part of where the abstraction comes in is notice it has like integer field, Boolean field. Um, this is gonna make sure that there's consistency across all of the data model that's created. Also things like primary underscore key equals true is way easier to write than you know, having to write the full SQL statements. So by writing in this abstract form, this is gonna increase security because the machine is gonna go through, read this class, turn it into SQL as opposed to the human inputting SQL. Sorry, continue. <laughs> so then Django takes this and to create that form on the index page, it's just simple four lines. Just in, instantiating the two classes, naming the model, and then naming the fields that I want to have the users fill out. And that gets taken into this index, which is also pretty standard. It's just this form tag. Django 
realizes that there's a form and then looks for this forms.py file and creates the form from that. And then all I have to do is insert this submit button and that's the index page. But then there's also this CSRF token and method post here. This CRF token is required as that is to create cross-site scripting. And then this method post is so that you don't get that SQL command in the URL that we saw earlier. Yep, so that's the, those are two techniques, well actually three techniques there to make sure that this form is secure at all levels. So the CSRF, um, SRA people I'm sure will we'll learn about that, but if you search for CSRF token, uh, that's for cross-site request uh, fr fraud or forgery, forgery I believe it is. Um, think of uh, you're on a website, I'm an attacker, I open up this form in an iframe or like a window off to the side and then I submit the form on your behalf. This prevents that from being possible. Um, the form being abstracted, right? He didn't write any form inputs. It's just purely based on the data model. So that helps with the front end validation as well to know like in the case of my checkbox where I screwed up and I didn't put the check value, he's not gonna have that even be a thing. And then he's absolutely right on the method being post. Post is um, already a more secure, it's not perfect, but it's a more secure way of sending data than get is, right? which is uh, get was via the URL, post is via hidden, hidden information kind of stuffed in the headers of what's sent. And then from this static, from this template here, moves on to the views. This is what is actually generating the web page. There's a couple more layers of abstraction here. This line specifically creates the form instance. And then it checks if the form is valid whenever the user hits the submit button. And if it is, it'll save the form. This is what's actually saving data to the database give you the message that was created and then redirect you. And down here, if it's not valid or if it's trying to get any data from the database, it just reloads the form. And this final line is just Django rendering the web page. So I don't know if Python is actually part of the IST curriculum yet vaguely vaguely yeah but this is i mean honestly like in reading through this because i don't write a lot of python this would be why it's being considered um quite seriously you saw the amount of php that i had to write to do even half of what this is doing um not to mention this is kind of becomes copy and paste so if you wanted to start a boilerplate hello world application and just start sending data back and forth to a database um, this is like take the files and start, you know, copy the folder basically and rename some things. Are you, does this have like a database visualizer from here or are you just saving this to uh, a SQL light? You can see the databases here, the actual tables themselves. Then you can go further down and pull and see what data is actually there. That's awesome. So this is, uh, what's PyCharm? Is that what this IDE is named? Yeah. Okay, cool. And this last bit right here is actually how you are connecting to the database. So when I set this website up in using Reclaim Hosting, which I just sent the link out for in the Slack if you wanna go check it out, I had to insert this bit of code here to actually connect the database to the SQL database that I set up to the web app itself. So if we take a look at that real quick, there's the data that I entered before, it's still saying done, but with Django it comes with this nice admin page. So you can see all of the entries that are in the database graphically. I go in, I can see that there's the username, there's the date that I had put in, and also the age, and then code is marked as true. So with this, you can go in and see all the data, but then you can also edit it if need be. And 
Mm. That's about it. Sick. Awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, so this is kind of your PHP my admin equivalent, but it's actually specific to the application you're building. So, um, did you use a boilerplate for that, or did you just write all that? Uh, bits and pieces were boilerplate. Some of it I did have to write custom. Django comes with commands to create the project and all the files that you need. And then from there you would create your own. Awesome. Well, thank you for showing me up royally. That, that is the point. Um, so um, I'd say the biggest takeaway from that example with, with Django is abstraction and the power in the abstraction, right? You're, yes, you are investing in learning a framework at that point, which is not, you know, it's not transferable in the same way if you had another Python project, right? If you had a Python project that you were building out and it was in a different framework, well, all your Django knowledge doesn't really translate directly. I mean, parts of it do. However, the gains as far as that automated security layer, as far as just input validation, setting up databases rapidly, um, you can really build things a hell of a lot faster and more secure leveraging these abstractions. Um, an abstraction layer we're gonna look at across a couple projects in the future uh, is called Symfony. So Symfony is a PHP-based abstraction layer. It's adopted by Drupal and another project called GrabCMS. Um, I actually think I have some Symfony components and some work I'm doing too. Um, but um, we're gonna look at those abstractions and um, how they interface with databases to do secure connections in PHP land in some major open source projects, um, but also in flat file systems. So we're gonna start kind of getting this mix of like SQL, SQL light, no SQL types of concepts. Um, this course is about data structure and looking at different data structures and how to manipulate them. So while SQL really came before all the more modern ways of interfacing with data, they all still have a parallel of some kind. So um, in the next few weeks, because we're starting into our CMS unit, series of units, uh, we're gonna start building out sites with Drupal, uh, WordPress, Hack CMS, Grav CMS. Um, there are some other platforms that we'll look at in this type of way that we just did back and forth here uh, that you can't install in uh, Reclaim Hosting because they require a lot of file management locally, but it'll still be useful to see the way different groups interface with the web and build out data models off of these flat file systems. So um, now it's lab five time with the trolley glasses. I'm just sticking with the business time one. I, I don't, I, I'm too lazy to make anything else, but I did put glasses on them now. So um, the deliverable for lab five, um, I'm gonna get rid of that word. So um, there's multiple ways to approach this, this week. So it covered basically four overarching themes in my mind. Um, and so any one of those four, you know, can be the way that you, that you finish this lab. And I've laid out what the four options are and we'll look, look through them. Um, but I'm gonna start trying to do this. This is the way my 402 class uh, runs, uh, which I am teaching in the spring. If any of you need a 402 and can, and can take it, it'll be very similar, um, is providing avenues for you to kind of pursue the thing you wanna do that's still in the vein and relevant to what we've been talking about uh, in class. So each of these has a writing and a video submission component. So that's the same across them, but you pick one of these options. And I'll explain what the four options are. So option one, would be more of your like database administrator getting more into SQL land. So um, identify the norm, some normal forms in your database, right? So given that I have a pretty reasonable definition of normalized data in normal form one, two, and three, read through um, that data scientist article. She does a really good job of laying out ways to actually identify data that's incorrectly normalized or to make it more abstract. And then she gets into the SQL commands using alter statements, um, which some of you showed in, in your videos for the lab, which is awesome because we didn't talk about alter statements, but a database alter statement allows you to manipulate the structure of the table after the fact. So let's say you screwed up and you went, oh, uh, I've got a text field here. It would actually, and it's the name of a city. Uh, that should be in the location table 
because you already had a location table. So you have a unique identifier, a primary key in the locations table. You can run an alter statement against your other table, basically eliminate that field you have currently and add a new field to account for the primary key. Um, so uh, in this one, you're gonna write up uh, the difference between you know, identify two normalized forms of data in your database that you made already last week. And then you're gonna write up the difference between these two um, and why they make sense. It doesn't, you don't always have to move everything to the third normalized form of data. It's not like a one is better than two is better than three. <laughs> it's more like a knowing why you have it that way. So uh, for this one, do a screencast that points to these, points out these forms and explains uh, the same thing as mentioned in the, in the first part, right? So explain what these two normal forms are and then do an alter statement um, to manipulate one of the tables to change its normal form. Um, so that one's definitely in the weeds of SQL land, um, but I'd say go off of that blog post. Um, you can you know, ask for help if you, if you choose this option. There's three other options though. So second option would be to uh, research SQL injection approaches. So I want you to find three common methods of attack and write up the ways that applications can be designed to mitigate these, right? So we already discussed two in, cl in class today between what, how Jonah's um, <laughs> application basically mitigated the multiple SQL injections that were possible in my application. Um, so in this, if you're gonna go this route, write up you know, those three ways of mitigating certain SQL or injection attacks. And then I want you to try your hand at modifying the provided scripts. So my two really watered down crappy scripts are linked on the course uh, website. Um, I want you to actually load them up and try either to exploit them or to fix and account for the, you know, clean up the way that you would handle the injection in that. Um, if you end up running into errors doing that, I mean, I know this, again, this is not a super programming intensive course and this is a programming task. So if you run into issues with that, you know, feel free to ask your ask for help. If you're if you end up needing to kind of more explain what areas cause injection and show what a potential injection would be, that's also perfectly acceptable. Um, and that would be in the screencast. So, option three would be create a flowchart of how the web application connects from the user input to front end code to the server handling that data and querying the database to return the result. Right, like do a write up and make a, a flow chart showing that whole thing end to end uh, that I showed in my super basic example. Uh, try your hand at modifying the provided scripts in order to wire up the form, right? So you have something that you can play with. Um, maybe wire that to your database instead of mine and to you know, inserting a record into a table in your, in your application as opposed to mine. Uh, do a screencast explaining the diagram and show your code in action in your video. And then the fourth option would be um, much more exploratory. So create a mini application in the framework of your choosing, and that can be so much as a hello world. There's lots of frameworks out there in, in programming land. Not all of them are even that hard to deploy, to be perfectly honest. Um, and the, uh, just it needs to render data from a backend uh, with a database of some kind. Uh, Jonah, how long did you spend on that one that you made? All right, so uh, if you couldn't hear that on the thing, Jonah said it took about a half an hour to build that um, and then another hour to actually debug and get it working. You mean up on that live website or? Okay, so to get it working up on that live website. Now, Jonah could be some freakish alien rock star that that is like an illogical value, um, but it really isn't, you know, if you have the right IDE in Python, um, it's really not that hard to get something like that up and going. <laughs> it's, it's one of those, like, it seems like it's a lot more work than it actually is. Um, however, there's lots of frameworks out there to build hello world little mini applications. So try one out, uh, experiment with it, try to get a hello world app going that allows you to talk to a backend. And then I want you to do a screencast using that as the backdrop, um, pointing out the relationship between the front end and back end, as well as your experiences working with that framework, right? Um, 
if there's a framework that's really popular, it's usually because people started to glob on and talk about it and say, oh, it solved this problem for me and make little tutorial videos and things. Try to be one of those initial hello world. Here's my review of, you know, it could be Symphony, it could be um, Django, it could be anything that you're interested in learning in this sphere. So that one's very open-ended. Um, then submission, create a blog post, embed your screencast at the bottom and mention the post and, oh, mention in the post the option you selected. That will just help with evaluation. Um, and then submit the post to Lab 5 SQL to web channel on Slack, as usual, due by Sunday at the end of the day. Uh, so the rubric for this is gonna be much more contextualized um, and a bit more open-ended in me explaining in here, but um, basically I just wanna see that you're accurately conveying the concept in written form for whatever option you selected. Um, and that you're trying, attempting to demonstrate technique in the video for that option or, you know, whatever your visualization is, right? If you decide to do the, make a, make a diagram that shows front end to back end web and your application doesn't fully work, that's not like you're going to lose credit for it. But if you explain a front end to back end relationship via diagram and the diagram is completely wrong and it doesn't make any sense, that's where you lose points because that's not you're supposed to convey the concept in question. Um, so for example, if it said show two normalized forms and you don't, and you just tell me the definition of data normalization, <laughs> that, would be, that would be not conveying the concept accurately. Um, so again, if, you're, if you wanna pursue one of these coding ones um, and you need help actually writing the code or debugging something, feel free to ask. There are a lot of programmers in this course. I happen to, write a little bit of code as well. Um, so we're gonna be using Reclaim Hosting and just as a heads up, it's for the next next four weeks um, at minimum. The final project you could also choose to do via Reclaim Hosting as part of why I wanted it there. So we had an easy option. Um, so just, uh, and this is this applies to certainly option two and three, the ones that involve enhancing the database you're working on. Um, so, um, if you need to add a user to MySQL, there's a button to do that in Reclaim Hosting. Um, I'll show that for lab time on Thursday, um, but obviously this lab's a bit more open-ended by design. But if you need to add a user to Reclaim Hosting's MySQL, you, have to, you can't actually do it via phpMyAdmin. If you go and Google how to do this, you'll find that there's like a tab you don't have. Um, that's for security on their end. But if you need to add a user, which I had to for my little example, um, you can add a user via their interface. And then there's another button that allows you to add a user to a database. So first you have to kind of create a user, then you have to actually associate that user to a database. In that, it's gonna to go to another step that says, hey, what, pr what privileges does this user have? And so um, another cool, you know, just database abstraction layer that MySQL provides from a security standpoint is all the statements that you've logged in and ran, you can actually create accounts that have targeted read write capabilities. So you could say, oh, this user account of making can only do insert statements. That means they won't be able to select any data at the database layer, right? So you can use this in part for securing an application further. Um, then in Reclaim Hosting, there's a file manager tab. So if you hit file manager, it'll show you what all the files are that actually are powering your little web server. And then if you double tap um, www, this puts you into the folder that is associated with the top level of your domain. So if you wanted to take you know, the db.php and insert.php, or you wanted to push up your own example because you know how to write PHP code better than my terrible example by, de by design, um, you can just upload them directly through the interface or create a new file and edit it live there. So um, this is what I ended up doing and I'm just pasting the code in, hitting save and making sure that it works and wanted to illustrate what I have. So uh, final note, uh, user man, and I did just mention this, but user management's usually done via SQL statements, um, but because Reclaim Hosting is known as shared or managed hosting, uh, it means they also have an abstraction layer that's protecting you all from kind of hijacking each other's SQL accounts. Um, so the files for the simple db.php and insert.php are linked on the course lab uh, website. Um, looking ahead, uh, we're gonna start into CMSs the next three weeks. 
Um, we'll learn about different database-driven CMSs, uh, Drupal, WordPress, uh, some of the forks of those as far as the community aspects of those projects, what they mean, uh, the technologies they're powered on, uh, look at database queries that they run. Um, for example, any given Drupal page is going to run anywhere from about 88 to 400 database queries uh, to render a single page. <laughs> um, and they have a really cool tool called Devil um, that allows you to basically inspect and kind of see what it took to make the page in question. So we can kind of reverse engineer how these really complicated U UIs uh, stamp themselves out to better understand them. Um, next week, uh, we're going to start into uh, flat file and static site generators and see the way that they manage data. Um, it's a radical departure from SQL. I don't know, none of them use SQL um, to my knowledge that we're gonna look at, but just for a comparison and contrast to some other ways that people are starting to structure data and they're still thinking about things in these normalized forms of information, um, but they're accessing them in radically different ways. So we're gonna look at, at those next week and then be able to uh, compare and contrast that with like WordPress and Drupal and how these big systems that, I mean, honestly power about half the websites you've ever been to, <laughs> uh, how those end up work, working. So uh, with that, I think we're at about end of class. You know, we got eight minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Thursday, I'm going to start off showing or going into a little bit of detail on what those, you know, options two and three are. Um, we'll also just be hanging around. Feel free to ping me on Slack if you have any questions about the specific options to do or whatever. But does anybody have any questions? Either in real life or, or on Slack. All right. If not, then I'll catch you all Thursday or Sunday at 11.59.